All right, well, welcome back, everybody. Hi, I'm thrilled to uh, introduce our afternoon session on Franklin. Um, this is inspired, of course, by Barbara Oberg's uh, 13 years at the helm of the Franklin Papers, uh, during which time she produced eight volumes of Franklin Papers, if I did the math correctly. Did I get that right, Barbara? You... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, and also created uh, what was an innovative and pioneering effort at digital access with the franklinpapers.org, which at the time was probably one of the first efforts to make available freely online these paper projects. Um, and so to uh, host uh, our conversation today, we've asked Joe Edelman. Um, Joe is joining us from Framingham State University, where he's an associate professor. Um, when you hear his work, you'll see why we chose him for this panel. His first book was titled Revolutionary Networks, The Business and Politics of Printing the News, something Franklin knew a little bit about. <laughs> uh, it was awarded an honorable mention uh, by the St. Louis Mercantile Library Pr Prize. Um, and he's also at work currently on a book on the post office in America. Something else I think Franklin knew a little bit about. <laughs> and Joe also has himself been a pioneer in digital history, uh, serving as an assistant producer and consulting uh, historian for uh, Ben Franklin's World, an award-winning podcast. And he was a founding me member of The Junto, an early American history blog. Uh, for his contributions to the advancement of knowledge in early American history, he was elected to the membership of the American Antiquarian Society in 2019. Joe? Patrick? Um, Thank you all for coming back. <laughs> Thank you all for coming back for this afternoon session on Franklin. Um, I, I've gotten tossed about but, and, and thinking about the young Franklin who would be very concerned if anyone fell asleep and wasted any of our time um, that is available to us and the old Franklin who would be asleep in the corner and then wake up and tell a dirty joke. Um, so choose your path <laughs> for the session however you wish. Um, I was thinking this morning, um, not of Franklin or Jefferson, but of the Adams Papers. Um, Serena, when you made the comment about people thinking about solo heroes of the revolution, um, it, it brought back to mind the John Adams quote. Um, I usually remember it better from the musical 1776, that version, than the actual letter, but of Franklin and Washington sort of conducting the whole war by themselves, and no one's going to remember poor little John Adams. Um, I live outside Boston now, and he's doing okay. Um, but we, we nonetheless have uh, a moment to think about Franklin, and I think many Franklins, or multiple Franklins on this panel. Um, both of the sessions this afternoon look at um, sort of very traditional founders, and I think that's an interesting way to, to frame it and to think about um, what is and has been over the last, I don't know, five, 10, 20 years, um, a very broad re-examination of the founders and their relationship to America, to America in the 1770s, to America in the present. Um, we've been talking about the 250th at various points. Um, Franklin, as uh, we've talked about in casual conversation, I'm trying to, I've been trying to figure out how to formulate a question about Ken Burns' documentary from last year. Um, he finally got his four hours of Ken Burns' attention. Um, <laughs> But he, he, and in the intro, I'm now forgetting which historian said that he's, he's most relatable of the founders, I think is the, the comment that, um, I don't think it was you, but I forget yeah. exactly, it's not the kind of thing you would have said. Um, <laughs> but we, we think of him, um, so Ben Franklin's world, as this sort of avatar of vast early America, that he's sort of a stand-in of, of everything. Um, I myself am guilty of that. Um, I torment my students by teaching a research methods course that they're required to take. When I teach it, I teach the many worlds of Benjamin Franklin, um, and they come in a little confused, and by the end, most of them are converted to the idea that you can think about just about anything um, using Franklin and his family in some way, shape, or form. Um, so our panel today will focus on just a few of the areas of scholarship about Ben Franklin. Um, I will introduce each of them in turn. They've asked me not to use my um, phone as a timer, so instead during lunch, you may not have seen Patrick and I do this, but we went under the stage and hit a Leiden jar <laughs> under each of the chairs that's connected to the chair. So if you go over, there may be a small electrical shock. <laughs> oh, I love an audience that understands Franklin jokes. <laughs> um, 
With that, let me introduce our panelists. Um, immediately to my right is Joyce Chaplin, who's the James Duncan Phillips Professor of Early American History in the Department of History at Harvard, um, where she teaches the histories of science, climate, colonialism, and the environment. Um, she has affiliate appointments in a variety of other uh, departments and schools, um, including Graduate School of Design at Harvard, um, and is currently a trustee of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, she's published a number of books. Um, I will only give you the two most relevant. One is a biography of Benjamin Franklin, the first scientific American, Benjamin Franklin and the Pursuit of Genius, which came out in his tercentenary year in 2006. Um, and she is the editor of the Norton Critical Edition of Franklin's autobiography. Um, to her right is Ellen Cohn, who is the current editor-in-chief of the papers of Benjamin Franklin and a senior research scholar in the Department of History at Yale. Um, she's been with the Franklin Papers since 1979, um, when the team was just beginning its work on Franklin's diplomatic mission to France in the late 1770s. Um, and she's been director of the project since 1999. Um, she's written and lectured widely on a variety of aspects of Franklin's views and activities, uh, science, diplomacy, his literary essays, his musical life, and the private press and type foundry at Passy. Um, and finally, on the far right is Ed Gray, who's taught early American history at Florida State, which we in Framingham like to call the other FSU, uh, since 1999. Um, he, the smile on his face will indicate to you that he is done with his term as chair of the history department there, which he served from 2013 to 2022. Sorry, Serena. Um, and is the author of seven books, including uh, Tom Paine's Iron Bridge, Building a United States, published in 2016, which was selected um, by Bethany McLean as a 2016 best business book in strategy and business. Um, his writings have appeared in the Times Literary Supplement, Commonplace, which he also edited, um, and the William Murray Quarterly. And he's the co-editor with Jane Kamensky um, of the Oxford Handbook of the American Revolution. So with that, I will turn it over to Joyce and let her tell you a little bit about her perspective on Franklin. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe, and um, my thanks to the conveners of this event for inviting me to it. Um, I have, I do have a short script, lest I risk electrical rebuke um, and run over. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not actually sure whether everyone who signs on to the Papers of Benjamin Franklin um, project knows that they're going to become cited experts in the history of science. But that expertise um, is definitely there and respected, and it's present in the eight volumes that Barbara and her team edited, um, volumes 28 through 35, covering the period from March 1779 to October 1781, published from 1990 to 1999. Um, earlier volumes, uh, especially those from Leonard Labrie's initial editorship, had tended to discuss any science within what historians of science now call an internalist perspective. That is, the science was described and judged according to present day definitions of science. Um, so Franklin's electrical experiments were evaluating, evaluated according to 20th century definitions of physics. Um, and therefore these early volumes lack a kind of fuller, thicker description of the cultural context for science and sometimes political context. Who could do it? Uh, what did they think they were doing? Um, questions that are now parts of the academic field but weren't uh, when the project started in the 1950s, 1960s. This new emphasis is critically important in seeing how science is not only or necessarily the unfolding of timeless truths um, about non-human nature, Rather, it's precisely the human apprehension and value um, that are always present and inseparable from science. Um, historians of science now really pay attention to both how today's science was generated, looking at its history in the past, but also what it meant historically in its own moment as that process happened. And this attention around the context of science to the human is, I think, really admirably built into the scholarly apparatus of what I'm going to call the Oberg volumes. Um, and I don't mean to make the team invisible, <laughs> um, but uh, those, those eight volumes um, under um, Barber's editorship. So 1779 to 1781. Um, this isn't the interval most people think of as most significant for Franklin's work in natural science. And certainly, it's decades after his most famous work, the electrical experiments that he published in 1751, which gave him his initial fame. 
end this period is also uh, just a little before the end of the American War for Independence, which offered him time to write up some long-deferred scientific thoughts that he'd been percolating, that had been percolating, but he didn't have time to do anything about. These were finally published in the Transactions of the American Philosophical Society, which, after all, he'd helped to found. Um, but there are two aspects of the history of science um, that feature in the eight Oberg volumes, for which I think the editing is invaluable. Um, so first, the topics on which Franklin corresponded during this time have continuing resonance for problems in science today. In 1779, for instance, he considered the composition of the atmosphere after there was a vivid display of the aurora borealis that had dazzled La Tout Paris um, in December 1778. So, wow. But what was it? People were trying to figure out a good explanation, finally, for what this was. And in a kind of a fragment of a sliver of free time, <laughs> Franklin wrote out some suppositions and conjectures on the aurora, aurora borealis. It's an interesting essay for being studded with question marks, um, indicating that his goal was to state hypotheses, not conclusions, that might be helpful, even if they didn't provide a final answer. These included big questions about the circulation of the Earth's atmosphere, which, in fact, don't explain everything about the Northern Lights, um, but show Franklin's under-acknowledged work, I think, on atmospheric circulation, as connected to his only slightly more acknowledged work on climate. And yes, the wildfires in Canada <laughs> are the perfect um, uh, sort of demonstration that these topics have ongoing significance um, uh, as grounded within some of the science of the 18th century. Another example, Franklin considered the technical problem of ventilating buildings in order to maintain human health. In this, he collaborated with Scottish surgeon Alexander Small in an essay that he wanted to publish in France. Um, Finally, he corresponded with a French man of science, the Abbé Soulevy, on emerging theories of geological time uh, based on observations of fossils as well as geology. Uh, so in these three examples, we see Franklin's attention to enduring problems, atmosphere and climate, health and ventilation of indoor spaces, and our place within a long, long history of the planet. Just a few instances of how the fine standard of editing of Franklin's papers yields material at the heart of both 18th century science specifically, but also modern science more generally. The second issue related to the history of science that is covered in the eight uh, Oberg and team volumes is maybe one of modern science's biggest experiments, which is putting it above national and political divisions. That effort at nonpartisanship had emerged as a shared goal among European nations for slowly for some time, but especially during the Seven Years' War, uh, where there were almost theatrical <laughs> um, uh, gestures made um, of solidarity in scientific uh, practices. And this kind of nonpartisanship was supposed to continue during the American War. Franklin honored the sense of internationalism when he drafted US passports to British emissaries who represented, interestingly, religion and science. Um, so he did this for a supply delivery to a Moravian mission on the coast of Labrador. And perhaps better known, he did it for the expedition of Captain James Cook. Let these ships pass. They are not British warships. They are exploring the world. Um, this was in 1779, before hostilities had ended. So the passport for Cook in particular, won Franklin praised for exemplar, uh, exemplifying how a man of science was above the fray when it came to scientific investigation. Franklin himself benefited from the supranational community of science in 1779. So late that year, an English friend, Benjamin Vaughan, edited an edition of Franklin's works, political, miscellaneous, and philosophical pieces that was published in London during the war. Um, just to spell out the implications of this, Vaughan was therefore publishing the work of someone who was in a formal stance of treasonous rebellion against Britain still, and who was soliciting anti-British military assistance from other European nations. But his status as philosopher of the natural world in essence balanced against, balanced against his partisan stance in the war, and no government official raised an eyebrow at having his pu works published in London despite his outlaw status. Um, and here's where I think the editorial headnote to Vaughan's preface in the, the papers of Benjamin Franklin is exemplary and succinctly outlining what was at stake 
in publishing Franklin in this manner, including Vaughan's choice of publisher and his selection of the compendium's contents. Now, I will have to immediately add that this posture of intellectual neutrality over science um, and of a scientist's philosophical thoughts more generally, this wasn't perfectly maintained in Franklin's era, and it still isn't now. It's a work in progress as defined in this era. Um, moreover, um, and troublingly, it was mostly limited to Western nations, um, rarely extended to people beyond which the passport given to James Cook during his openly imperialist operation into the Pacific made clear. So this chauvinism, if not racism, remains a problem for science today. Again, unfulfilled work, however interesting the original definition of this task might have been. But I want to end with a smaller example of the international interpersonal uh, co cooperation in science, insisting that this is something that can offer um, peace beyond many kinds of boundaries, um, opportunities, and knowledge for everyone. Um, and this is an example that stands in probably, a, I hope, a less toxic place than the Cook expedition. Um, during the war, Franklin collaborated with a scientist whose sites of work, his, whose location straddled Britain and a nation that was uh, during the war, carefully maintaining its neutrality, this being Austria, which was dynastically allied with France uh, via Marie Antoinette, but not interested in um, foregoing good relations with Great Britain. Um, Franklin's collaborator was the Dutch-born physician and experimenter Jan Ingenhaus, uh, who, among other things, inoculated members of the Austrian royal family against smallpox, and he described what would later be called photosynthesis. Um, Ingenhaus had met Franklin in London and was a steadfast correspondent. They become friends. Um, and uh, keeps, uh, he keeps up his uh, correspondence while Franklin is stationed in Paris and despite everything else going on. Ingenhaus also realized that Franklin disliked not being able to continue to do any experiments. He was too busy. Um, uh, with his diplomatic duties. So when Franklin gave up on an entire experimental design and apparatus that he developed on heat conductivity, testing how different metals conducted heat using the rates at which wax melted, it's a very Franklin <laughs> kind of very raiding the kitchen, you know, to find <laughs> your laboratory um, stuff. But he gave up on it and handed it over to his friend Ingenhaus. Um, but at that point, Ingenhaus refused to abandon him. Um, he carried out the experiment while reporting it to Franklin, regarding him as co-investigator, despite everything. Um, this correspondence is included um, in uh, the one, uh, several of the volumes that, that Barbara edited, and it's a notable episode in the history of science, also an 18th century friendship, and its navigation through international divisions, and with the tricky business of assigning authorship and priority in science. Um, so I'll end with uh, this piece of prose that I really love, um, this compact, insightful, essential footnote in volume 34 on page 121, annotating Ingenhaus's final letter on the experiment. Quote, Ingenhaus published his findings in 1785, and despite his vigorous disclaimers that the idea had been entirely BFs, the procedure came to be known as the Ingenhaus experiment. See volume 32, page 344N, close quote. <laughs> It's taped on. It's taped on. <clears throat> well, gosh, I... First, I have to say a preliminary comment to my preliminary comments, which is that it is so gratifying to hear a scholar make such excellent use of the footnotes as well as the <laughs> documents in our volume. Um, I happen to know who wrote the footnote that she ended with. Um, Barbara knows too. But the, we... I don't. 
<laughs> That's okay. It's a collaborative project, and we never break silence, even though I sort of just hinted at it immodestly. Um, <laughs> how Franklinian. How could I? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, um, anyway. I now want to say what a very, very great pleasure, what a particular pleasure it is for me to participate in today's celebration. And I want to thank Barbara for asking me. We go back a very long way. And as I was reflecting on who was going to be uh, on today's program, it occurred to me that I'm not sure this is true, but it seems to me that I may be the panelist who has had the longest professional association with Barbara Oberg of any of us. Um, I had already been at the Franklin Papers for seven years when Barbara came to take over as editor-in-chief. Uh, in 1986, and 13 years later, when she left to take the helm of the Thomas Jefferson Papers at Princeton, <clears throat> the board selected me uh, to succeed her as editor-in-chief. So um, I think I am probably uniquely qualified to um, talk about the impact that she had on the Franklin Papers project. And her influence, I think, uh, touches on all the various aspects that have been chosen to be highlighted at today's conference. Um, so I'm going to use my whatever, however many minutes I have to talk about Barbara. And then later on, um, I'm very happy. I need no encouragement to talk about Benjamin Franklin. Um, Barbara steered us through um, what was certainly a transitional period at the project from a time decades before she arrived when editors, uh, chief editors might make unilateral judgments about whether, say, post office records were of no historical value. <laughs> um, to a time when our indexes, and here's a plug for using the indexes instead of just doing electronic word searches, we spend a lot of time on them and you can use them in ways that no word search can, uh, uh, can help you with. Um, so from a time when a top-down approach I know best yielded to indexes that have entries uh, far more inclusive than ever before. Now, to say that this was a straight line would be misleading. When I joined the team in 1979, the editor-in-chief was William Bradford Wilcox, a man who I revered and considered almost uh, devastatingly eloquent. I learned the craft of annotation by paying very close attention to the research notes that the editors gave him and what he then did with them. My real mentor, however, was Claude Ann Lopez, who, uh, and this is a longer story, but Claude was hired when the project first began in 1954. She was what was known at the time as a faculty wife, who, because of that status, was not allowed to hold a job at Yale University, so she was paid under the table by the Franklin Papers as a native French speaker to sit in the back of the room at a manual typewriter and transcribe all the documents from Franklin's French mission. Eventually, when the second chief editor arrived, Bill Wilcox, who succeeded Leonard Labrie, he recognized Claude's brilliance and her contributions. After all, she had in that time written two best-selling books on Benjamin Franklin based on her sitting there and transcribing the letters, one being 
Mon cher papa, Franklin and the ladies of Paris. Hello, women's history. No one had ever thought to do that before, and it continues to be the book that, ev- that is the touchstone for all further work. Secondly, she decided that all this history of great men in isolation from the context of their families made no sense. And with a co-author, Eugenia Herbert, they wrote a book that was absolutely seminal in the field of what is now called family history. But there was no family history at the time. And that book was called The Private Franklin. That situated Franklin in the context of all of his family members, and also incidentally, had a chapter on slavery, which I think is the first chapter written on Franklin and slavery. In any case, It's not as though when I joined the Franklin Papers, there was no sense of enlightenment. There was. However, um, Claude would complain to me bitterly in those early years about the fact that the chief editors refused to kind of get it. The fact that, you know, why didn't Franklin sail home from England when his wife was dying? How? Isn't that interesting? Doesn't that tell us something? And she was incredibly frustrated by the dismissive answer she got. So all of that changed. The atmosphere in the office entirely changed when Barbara Oberg uh, was hired to succeed Wilcox, who tragically died in office. Um, No one had to argue for the importance of inclusion of other voices um, when when Barbara was in the big office. Uh, On another topic that we will, I think, touch on later today, funding and fundraising. When Barbara arrived, this was in the middle of the Reagan years, when funding for humanities, federal funding for humanities, uh, had been basically gutted. And we at the project had been scraping. We rationed pencils. We were uh, scraping to make our annual operating budget year after year after year. I don't know this for sure, but I think that one of the reasons Barbara was selected to come in as editor at that moment was that she was, in many senses, the perfect person for that time and place. Barbara proved to be a fantastic uh, fundraiser, and by the time she located new private sources of money. She cultivated the federal agency so that we continued to get the full measure of federal grants. And by the time she left, 13 years later, we were in excellent financial shape, um, which was hugely important. She also brought an awareness and a sensitivity that none of us had had. Um, I mean, I was the very junior member, but it, the, the gap of generations between me and my colleagues was vast. Um, Barbara brought a sensitivity of documentary editing as a professional field. She had been out in the, in the wider world and had participated in the... Um, uh, in the um, the training session that was informally called Camp Edit that was run by the NHPRC to teach people how to do what we had been doing for a long time. And when she came, I mean, you've heard uh, about how scandalous it was that the Franklin Papers had stated in a headnote this business about the post office records. Well, we came to find out when Barbara arrived that something else in our own statement of methodology that had become an object of derision in the documentary community was a statement that when we transcribed, commas 
that were meaninglessly scattered throughout the manuscript would be eliminated. This was Bill Wilcox's idea of just making it easier for modern readers. I don't have to explain to this audience that the presumption that one knew better and that a particular comma was or was not meaningless was something that um, Barbara uh, <laughs> brought this fresh wind from the outer world to our dusty little uh, archive. And um, one of the things that she did, which deserves huge credit because she inherited a staff of heavily entrenched people set in their ways. One of the things that she did was to bring our methodology up to uh, modern standards. And the last thing I want to touch on quickly, which has already been mentioned by Patrick, is Barbara's role in uh, seeing that the Franklin Papers were digitized. Now, she was lucky in that David Packard, who sponsored the initial digitization, had family connections through complicated ways to our project. And he had been casting around for a new area to apply his um, extraordinary computer skills and interests. And it was the chairman of our board, Edmund Morgan, who suggested why not the papers of the founding fathers. Barbara immediately saw the value in this. And whereas editors at other projects, as I came to find out, were resisting, and university presses at that time, also many of them were resisting because of the idea that wouldn't a digital ed edition undercut the letterpress volumes? And Barbara and Ed Morgan and others said, no, this can only be of benefit. I mean, how Franklinian is that? And um, it wasn't easy, and I give Barbara a huge amount of credit for having spearheaded that whole initiative and making sure that um, it was done according to the standards that we all wanted. Um, and I'll wrap up with more praise, <laughs> if, you'll, if you'll allow me, which is that after she left, and and I became editor-in-chief of the Franklin Papers, we then had a relationship that was on a different basis. We were no longer supervisor employee. We were now colleagues in the community of what was then called, and probably still is called, the Founding Fathers Papers Projects, um, which was a consortium that was formed for the purpose of fundraising communally so that we all the projects weren't undercutting one another and trying to raise money individually. In that capacity, not only did my friendship with Barbara deepen, but I came to admire and really learn from her extraordinary ability to work with groups of people. Again, this is very Franklinian. To get things done. She did it with a kind of grace um, and diffidence that was um, very notable to me. She had, it still has, obviously, um, a real gift for bringing people together and to helping form consensus. One of the things that I observed that she did within that Founding Fathers group that has always stuck with me and impressed me very deeply was her concern. Of course, as I said, we were fundraising as a group. But did that necessarily mean that the money we raised had to be distributed equally among all five projects? Barbara, who was chair of that group for quite a while, argued that the ones of us who had been more successful 
in raising money for our projects could take less of the newly acquired funds and allow projects who hadn't been as successful to take a larger share of the pot. And that said to me that this was someone who wasn't out just for what she could get for her own uh, project. She was looking out for all of us. Um, and again, that's a lesson that I think uh, we would all do well to emulate. <laughs> High and low in whatever sphere of society one chooses to think about at the moment. So for all these things um, and more, uh, congratulations and thank you. You did pay me. <laughs> That's a harder act than normal to follow, um, especially because I don't believe that I've ever actually formally met Barbara. Um, um, but I can say that there is not a single scholar uh, uh, anywhere. Um, whose work has not had a more immediate and material impact on what I've done over the last nearly 30 years now. Um, so I'm incredibly honored to be here and to be able to participate in this and to offer my thanks to Barbara, uh, along with my fellow panelists and everybody else. Um, I'm, I'm also a bit of an interloper because uh, I'm... I'm new to Franklin scholarship, in a sense. Uh, I've been teaching a senior uh, capstone seminar on Franklin for 25 years. Um, so I, I've had a very uh, long-standing relationship with Franklin. Um, um, I also have spent the last 20 or so years interested in uh, questions related to money and finance, um, taxation, uh, the kind of things that I tell my students are, are really boring and therefore essential for them to pay attention to. Um, um, and at some point uh, at the end of my period as department chair, uh, as I was embarking on uh, a couple of semesters of, of research leave, um, I thought it would be a good idea for me to try to merge those two long-standing interests, Franklin and money. Um, um, and I, you know, began to, I proposed a few uh, 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 fellowship applications combining those interests. I um, was fortunate enough to receive a sabbatical fellowship from the APS, uh, uh, for which I'm, I'm very grateful, and, and it is for that reason that I now know Adriana uh, very well. I've known Patrick for a while, but thank you to you guys. Um, I, I can say uh, that this convergence of, of personal uh, career uh, uh, lines of inquiry um, could not have uh, come together in a more fortuitous way uh, in the sense that um, I can't imagine a better place to study Franklin and money than the APS. Um, you know, shout out to, to uh, Bethany and David uh, and Baird um, for the work they've done. I, I, I don't think, uh, n now that I've spent a few months uh, trying to um, gain even a tiny understanding of what is happening in Franklin's uh, business and financial affairs, um, uh, it, it's you know left me in awe of the of the work these digital scholars have done, um, and and you know uh, one could could offer uh, lengthy uh, uh, plaudits and and uh, and affirmations of this. I I, I think um, again it, it's the kind of work that. Uh, that uh, we scholars benefit from and is too often unsung and, and underpraised and underrecognized and, and of course uh, vastly underfunded. Um, so I, I actually wrote a paper for today um, and then I wrote a much shorter paper 
Um, 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 and then I thought, well, I'll just give some informal remarks. And then I bumped into Joyce after lunch, and she was reviewing her paper, <laughs> and I, I panicked. And so I thought, well, I better actually give my paper again. Um, and so I have a very short paper. That's time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, it, it, jo I, you know, so... Um, well done. Yes, you're right. Um, it, 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 I had reduced it, but, but I'm afraid, yeah, a uh, um, couple minutes. But um, I think what I, I'll do instead of actually reading my very short paper uh, <laughs> is, is just offer what I would characterize as notes from the archive. Um, um, and I have a slide, but I don't know how one access it. So it's this slide here. Um, so these are two documents that I think are familiar to the Franklin scholars in the room. Um, they're both uh, powers of attorney that grant Deborah uh, full power over Benjamin's frank, uh, uh, financial uh, affairs and business affairs. Um, one is uh, from 1733 and the other is from 1757. Um, and I've spent a fair bit of time thinking about these. Um, um, I think they're very interesting, and I think they point to, and I know one of our imperatives was to talk about new directions in Franklin scholarship, and I guess in some ways what I'm thinking about is new, very old directions in Franklin scholarship, which is uh, um, you know, thinking about uh, Deborah's role in the, what is really a family enterprise. It's, I totally agree with Joyce that it's not Franklin's business, um, even uh, after Deborah uh, passes, of course, it's still a family enterprise, and, and Richard and, and, and so on are, are involved. And, and, um, 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 but uh, what, what interests me about these documents, among other things, is uh, what they actually say um, or, or what they actually confer on Deborah and, and why they were necessary um, and why it was necessary to formalize what was already happening, namely that Deborah was already very much involved in uh, the family's uh, financial affairs, and I'm, I'm aware of the legal importance of these uh, of these things. Um, uh, obviously, this allows Deborah to appear in court on Franklin's behalf and so on. Um, um, but I've been thinking a lot about that and and about where that that might go in terms of thinking more generally about finance and about the law. In, uh, in colonial America. And there's another uh, power of attorney that, that is not extant, that is, I haven't actually found the, the legal document the form in this uh, way, but it's referenced in a letter uh, that Benjamin wrote to Deborah in 1772, um, in which he says that uh, they, they discuss another one that, that he's prepared. This is while he's in England still. Um, and what the letter says is that uh, this is a different kind of power of attorney because it effectively is creating a kind of co-trusteeship with uh, their son-in-law, Richard. Um, so this one departs from, from these two in the sense that it is not an exclusive uh, deputizing of, of or formalizing of Deborah's role, um, but uh, uh, an attempt to do that and to have a kind of co-trusteeship with Richard. Um, and at the time, it, it seems Deborah's health is, is beginning to deteriorate and so on, so that might be part of the reason. But uh, the reason I was going to introduce this in my paper uh, is because Franklin says very explicitly why he did it. He says that it's in order to facilitate debt collection. Um, and so this has left me thinking a good deal about this um, and about what that document and the preceding ones mean about the nature of person-to-person -person financing and the absolutely most central and pervasive uh, financial instrument of early America, which is the debtor-creditor contract, um, and the role that women uh, played in administering that core foundational uh, financial instrument. Um, so as I say, my thinking here is sort of notes from the archive. I haven't, I don't have a longer paper, Josh, yet, someday maybe, but, uh, uh, but that's where I am. So anyway, uh, again, thank you all, and, and thanks to Barbara.
Um, I want to ask one question, and then mindful of the time, um, and that can't leave Jefferson out. Um, I'll get the audience in. Well, I know, Joyce, you and I would just sit here and talk about Franklin, but <laughs> there are others in the audience. Um, is to ask you about um, thinking about Franklin, um, and there's an extent to which, with all the founders, one of the reasons why we have some of these documentary editions, um, and this is one of the things I tell my students, is that they wanted us to read all their stuff. Um, and I think Franklin, the most of those. Um, and in, in terms of Franklin, um, I don't know how many different articles have been written about Franklin that use the term self-fashioning, um, but his sort of self-mythologizing um, and the ways in which that that can sometimes shape things. Um, maybe we'll go offline for a Ken Burns conversation, but the, the first third of that documentary is basically working through the autobiography blow by blow, um, following um, you know, exactly the, the train of thought. Um, so I, I guess the question is um, for each of you in thinking about working on Franklin, either as a documentary editor or as, as writing about him, um, trying to write about other people in his family, trying to write about him in a particular way, um, about how you've managed that self-mythologizing, how you've worked through it. Um, I guess that's... I'm actually impressed by what we don't know about him. Um, I mean, it is true, for instance, that the autobiography was never completed and therefore never edited by him. And it could be that we're reading, we, we value these entire sections of it he might have thrown away. <laughs> um, real possibility. Um, I think in my biography of him, I talked about how he, he, he mentioned several times a decision-making process of drawing up two columns and putting checks and balances against, you know, do, is this a good thing, is this a bad thing? And we only have one surviving example of that, which means he burned or got rid of the others. Um, this is somebody who keeps his own archive on himself t since he was in his teens. So he does that, and he also wants you to like him. People like that run away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, the, the kind of self-mythologizing means that he doesn't want us to know everything about him. Um, and, uh, for instance, the first book he ever publishes, he tries to track down copies to destroy. So I think there's a lot missing, and he was responsible for that. Um, and thinking that he is always telling us everything, I think is very misleading, even though Right. I think, I think it was Walter Isaacson um, thinks that Benjamin Franklin is the most approachable of founding fathers. And I remind you that this is the guy who kept the archive on himself since he was in his teens and wants you to think that he's charming, which means that, yeah, sure, he seems like that, um, but maybe not really. Yes. <laughs> and also... Um, I just want to remind everybody, I, I mean, this idea of what has been preserved and what has not been preserved, absolutely critical for all of us in, in all the work that we do. And just want to quickly remind everybody that in the case of Benjamin Franklin, when he left for France at the outbreak of the revolution, all of his papers, uh, were packed away, almost all of them were packed away, and the British raided and destroyed a lot of them. So this is not a case of Franklin himself deciding he wanted to edit his legacy. Likewise, um, after his death, he willed, uh, he bequeathed all of his personal archive of papers to one of his grandsons, William Temple Franklin, who turned out, in my view, to not be a very careful steward of them. Um, that's another conversation. However, um, the idea was that William Temple Franklin was going to publish them all. It took him 30 years to get around to it. Now, can you imagine inheriting the papers of a man who was argu arguably the most famous man in the world at that time? The um, Western world, anyway, was clamoring for this edition, and he sat on it for decades. Um, during that 
30-year period, he stored the papers in the attic of a London tailor uh, who needed paper to make patterns. And so lots of the papers uh, were destroyed. And those that um, we have found, um, snippets of letters in the shape of um, uh, <laughs> cuffs, sleeves, etc. cetera. Um, so it's very difficult to make assumptions about what Franklin deliberately destroyed. And I'll say very quickly one more thing about where we can find the real guy. Much has been written about um, the self-mythologizing <laughs> aspect. That's why we write it and don't say it. <laughs> And all of it um, is true. One of the real joys of getting to do the kind of work that I do every day is that we see everything, everything that we have been able to find. And so we see jottings on the backs of random pieces of paper. We see lists. For example, we published them. Um, a list of names with a single line drawn down the middle of it. What in heaven's name? Well, I looked up every single name, and it turns out each one of these people, this is during the French years, each one of these people had done him wrong <laughs> in one way or another. And so when did he write it, and what was he thinking about, and why at this moment did he feel kind of um, compelled to th reflect on all the people who had tricked him? And then a single line just crosses them out. So things like this I find unbelievably evocative. Um, Somebody mentioned laundry this morning. We have a laundry list. It's hilarious. But that doesn't really give us a secret into his psychology. A very, very few documents which are the most revealing, which again, we publish, are letters that for one reason or another he drafted but then decided not to send. And so why were the drafts preserved? In one case, he wrote an absolutely hilarious satire on this guy who was bugging the heck out of him in France, Ralph Izzard. Um, and the only reason we have it is because he thought it was so clever that he couldn't help himself. He sent it to his sister after he got home from Europe. Um, because his sister was so upset that people were maligning him. And he said, don't worry, don't worry. I'm above it all. I can let it all wash off of me. By the way, just for you, <laughs> on pain of death, you know, you can't show this to anybody. I'm going to write you this funny thing I wrote about Ralph Izzard, but you can't show it to anybody. And it's only because he sent it to his sister that we've got it. So there are little nuggets like that that if you look closely at our volumes, you can find them. And we as editors have tried our best to put them in context and to describe the, um, well, the context in which they were written. And um, there's some wonderfully human and surprising things that emerge. I, I've been waiting all day to say that uh, if Jefferson is a sphinx, Franklin is an open hydrant. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's, he's a geyser, yeah, yeah, uh, old glory. Um, um, I'm going to leave it at that, I think. Uh, we have a few minutes, Adriana. Yeah, so for... we have a question online, and if others in the audience Ooh. have questions, I'll, I'll allow a few extra minutes. So um, let Thank me you. know. Okay. So this question is for Ellen, and it's from Linda Killian, and it is, when will the next volume of the papers be coming out? <laughs> oh, for me? Yep. Where's this? Um, 
just from like a voice coming. Oh, it, it's from the back. In the back corner. Oh, I see. It's a question from the live stream from Linda Killian. Oh, when's the next volume coming out? I'm happy to announce <laughs> that the next volume will be out next fall. This is a major milestone. This is the last volume covering Franklin's period in France. And it gets him from, uh, it, and it covers his final journey from Paris up to England, the famous meeting with his son in Southampton, and then crossing the ocean, during which passage he writes three major scientific papers that he then submits to the American Philosophical Society for publication. And the volume will end, this is a cliffhanger, um, <laughs> as the ship uh, pulls into Delaware Bay. So that, no surprise, volume, this is volume 44, volume 45 will open with Franklin being rowed ashore and stepping on American soil. Um, to be greeted with bells and huzzas and this and that um, after almost nine years abroad. So the answer, <laughs> the short answer is um, this fall. Are there other questions from in the room? We've literally said everything about Franklin. That's not possible. The geyser. <laughs> the geyser. Joe, do you want to ask one more question? Since you can, um, you can also say no. I, I could say no. I think that might be a, a wise idea. There's really no comment from the question from the audience. There's some odd. odd. <laughs> um, Anything I can apologize for? So, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we've got a little. All right, bit. Patrick's going to save us here. So. <laughs> It's coffee time. It's really yeah. <laughs> so actually, it's a question for Ellen, who has been immersed in the world of Franklin for so long, and I've heard you tell so many amazing stories uh, about Franklin. Um, and the work of a documentary editor is so much about producing for others, um, giving access to others. So, short question is: Have you ever thought about writing a biography of Franklin? Longer follow-up to that is, if you were to write a biography of Franklin, what would you say different from anybody else? <laughs> we have 43 I think that's our time. <laughs> no, the answer is no, I have no interest in writing biography. I am in the middle of uh, some other pieces that I think need to be written quite apart from the volumes. Um, I think discretion uh, dictates that I not talk about um, previous biographers, so that'll be, <laughs> that'll be it for me. You have half an hour to ask her until the next session begins. Um, thank you to all the panelists. Um, thank you to Barbara and, and to everyone here.